You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached the age of 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health Podcast, and I have Dr. Alan Christensen. Uh, he's the author of the Metabolism Reset Diet. Uh, he's a top naturopathic physician, and again, also best-selling author of the Adrenal Reset Diet. Uh, the book talks about a four-week cleanse that heals damage to the liver and helps readers unlock the key to rapid weight loss and lower blood sugar. So, uh, Alan, thanks for coming. Hey, Rich. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here with you. So tell me your uh, your hero origin story. Because people that work in uh, the health field in a specific area always seem to have issues that led them there. You know, isn't that often the case? Yeah, I'm, I'm no different in that regard. Um, I had seizures as a kid, um, likely complications from cerebral palsy. And it was a, it was a weird, weird childhood, I guess. I, I read at an early age and could figure things out well, it seemed, but I, I just couldn't do things specifically. And I really had no zero sports aptitude or running or playing or mm. stuff like that. And and I really knew nothing different, so that's just what it was. But then around adolescence, uh, you know, I was I was teased and ostracized, and the whole social world became more important to me then. And yeah, um, this was so far pre-internet and not even a lot of health books, but, you know, I found some and stumbled through some ideas and tried some things which didn't help and some things which I implemented badly, but eventually, yeah, just the basic advice and time and patience just changed my life. You know, I became just completely shifted, became somewhat athletic and had a blast with that. And, and it just gave me this strong conviction that, you know, your, your health is just, it's got to be there if you're going to have any kind of enjoyment in life. And, and then that just data, when it was the right stuff was found, when you applied it properly, it could be just life-changing for you. So it just set me on the whole arc of wanting to go into medicine and wanting to really integrate lifestyle that in some way and just set up everything afterward. So what's, um, so you, you focused in on adrenal health and uh, perhaps thyroid health as well. What, what did you find were the things that were affecting you and other people negatively? And what were some of the interventions or, you know, ways you found to fix it? You know, in my, in my personal case, it was more a matter of just eating, eating well, cutting out foods that, you know, I stored more than I burned and, and being active in ways that didn't injure me and slowly building it. But in medical school, my, the thing that really got my attention peaked was, was thyroid disease. And back, back then, you know, what was called normal, the normal range was three times as broad as it is now. And arguably it's still too broad now, but there were also some emergent views from the natural side, from the likes of Rhoda Barnes that were just radically different. And I saw how Many, many people had symptoms that did respond well to thyroid treatment, even though they didn't fit the diagnostic criteria of the day. But I also saw a lot of people that would have bad side effects from, from that. So I, I saw there was something there, but it, I didn't quite seem ready for prime time. And I also, I really resonated with these people because they had a lot of the symptoms that I had as far as just, you know, weight struggles and fatigue and chronic muscular pain. But they had already tried all the lifestyle things really well. And in many cases, that just did not move the needle for them until they had healthy thyroid function back. So that really brought me into endocrinology and, and the whole world of these hormones, these chemicals that in, you know, microscopic quantities, thyroid hormones, it's like a tenth of a grain of salt is what your body makes on a given day. 
And if that's gone, you die, you know, and if it's tripled, you could have your heart give out. So it's just a, the incredible power of these chemical messengers throughout the body. I really saw them as like the connection point between lifestyle and health. So what are some of the treatments that have uh, <clears throat> historically or even, you know, even now for, uh, for thyroid problems? Like what are, what are some common thyroid problems? What are some of the common treatments and what are some of the alternatives you found that uh, work better? Yeah. So early along, people had recognized hypothyroidism, just a deficit of thyroid hormone, and then hyperthyroidism, you know, an excess of that. And during the course of my practice, it became emergent that this was pretty much all driven by autoimmune disease. You know, we didn't really have a sense of that in the earlier days, but now we know that that's really the explanation unless there's some other explanation present. You know, a lot of folks can test to see if they have autoimmune disease for their thyroid, but many that have it will still test negative, even though it's there. So yeah, it's the default cause for that. And treatments, the conventional world, they've, they've never really gotten very deep into treating it. There's been so many papers recently looking at satisfaction surveys or quality of life amongst those with thyroid disease. And now there's a lot of hard data reflecting what many have, have observed, that these people are just really suffering and that the common treatment approaches don't work. What's really done in conventional medicine is just one, one medicine, which is an analog of the main hormone the thyroid produces. And that's given to get someone back into a rather broad normal range. And at the end of the discussion, you know, past that point, there's nothing else they have to offer. And about 60% of the time, people have the same symptoms they had before it started and maybe some improvement, but not much. And, you know, different courses, different directions on that, you know, there's, there's several hormones the gland makes that are important. There's three of them. So one distinct course of treatment is to encompass all the hormones as opposed to one. Um, another idea that is important is thinking about the blood levels beyond just what's normal, but what's really, what are the kind of scores we see in healthy people that are free of thyroid disease? And what if we try to target those as the end of treatment, you know, not, not just a broad normal range, but really what the scores would be if someone were lacking thyroid disease. And the other facet of things which can be done better is to think about what are the drivers of the whole autoimmune process, you know, because first and foremost, it is an immune disease. So what are the things that give rise to that process? And perhaps if those causative factors are addressed, that can also help the quality of life of people. So when you talk about, um, you know, thyroid medications, to get a little bit specific, you know, I guess you'd have to take Synthroid, which is, you know, the typical T4, uh, you know, thyroid replacement hormone. You'd have that if you had your thyroid removed, you know, due to cancer or other reasons. You'd take it if you're hypothyroid to bring your thyroid mm -hmm. levels back to normal function. Any other instances in which you'd take something like that? And then, you know, what are the alternatives? You mentioned, uh, you know, more natural alternatives. I, I, I've heard of armor or, uh, you know, other types of thyroid medication. Can you, can you go into that a little bit? For sure. So, yeah, you mentioned Synthroid and spot on. That's the most common brand name prescribed. And that is an analog of T4. And, and yeah, that's true. That's the treatment of choice for hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's, or post-surgical hypothyroidism. And the, the difference is that it's, it's one hormone and thyroid hormones work when the body converts them into a spectrum. So there's T4, but there's also T3 and T2. And it's, it's, it's very, very clear data that they all have roles to play that are important. And one, there's no one of those that's only purpose is to make the others. They're all needed. And the other part of it is that people that have thyroid disease, a really good chunk of them don't do a good job converting T4 into the other hormones. You know, it, if you measure things closely, you may see that the only way they get enough of the others is if they have too much of T4, and that's hard in other ways. You mentioned Armour Thyroid, so that's, a, that's the most commonly thought of brand in the category of natural desiccated thyroid, also called NDT for short. Other brands are out there, and different brands have different levels of quality control, and then also different inactive ingredients. The conventional world has been concerned about natural thyroid because of quality control, and current regulations are pretty stringent in that it has to be assayed for active hormone content. Uh, back in the 80s, that was not the place, and that was really when all the objections about natural desiccated thyroid came about. There were valid concerns back then, but they've not been valid concerns since 81. Uh, natural desiccated thyroid has all three of those hormones. That's one of the big perks about it. And there are other versions. There's compounded thyroid, which can be made with T4 and T3. 
but there's no other forms that have T2 present. And personally, I don't advise for compounded thyroid because there's, there's a real lack of standardization in how those products are made. And there's really no system by which after they're made, they're tested to assure that they have what they should. And I'm aware of a lot of cases in which that's resulted in catastrophic effects for people. So, yeah. And which ones are problematic, you said? So Synthroid, we well, know, is standardized it's T4, but what are the other, I mean, what are some of the other names that uh, you've seen either good or poor effects from? So the, the category I was referring to is compounded thyroid, and that's not a, not a brand name. That's when pharmacies will take the raw materials that would make up something like Synthroid. There's another medicine called Cytomel, which is a T3-only medicine. So pharmacies can purchase these raw materials, compounding pharmacies, and then mix those up per order. And there's a lot of cases where it's a good thing. And there are some ways by which they can do that better. But there are some situations in which that's not done well. And with thyroid hormones, the active amount is micrograms. So it's like a thousandth of a grain of salt. So it's a case to where you really do want standardization and consistent products. So how would you know, let's say you're going to get um, you know, thyroid hormone from a pharmacy. How would you know if it's compounded or not, or if it's you know, purchased from a manufacturer? Well, there's a, about, to my memory, six or so percent of pharmacies do compounding. And a doctor would have to say, this needs to be a compounded prescription. And you would go to a special pharmacy for that. So it's, it's just rather evident. You know, most routine pharmacies are dispensing. You know, they're buying a, a big vat of something like Synthroid and they'll at different potencies and they'll give out however many of the potency your doctor recommends. But yes, yeah, some actually do hand mixing. And it's, it's quite apparent when, when you're in that category. Natural desiccated thyroid, like, like Armour you mentioned, there's other brands like WP Thyroid, which are really free of binders or fillers. And those are ones where they are as well or arguably more closely standardized than even ones like Synthroid. And they are pre-made. They're, they're not hand-mixed. Yeah, I wouldn't want someone at the pharmacy to be texting their uh, boyfriend or girlfriend and compound my thyroid hormone <laughs> incorrectly. Well, you know, so think about yeah. The analogy I thought of is like, say you're making blueberry muffins, you know, and you got a cup and a half of blueberries for the batch. Does every muffin have four blueberries? <laughs> Not necessarily. And that's right. what compounding comes down to. And you're talking about micrograms. You could have a muffin that has 4,000 blueberries and it wouldn't look any different. <laughs> hey. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that's, that's very good advice. Yeah, so, um, I just jumped into it because I personally know I take Synthroid and all that stuff. Um, but um, you what know, are the probably about half hormones? Of those folks, about half the folks who yeah. are on it do fine and do well from that. But there are those that if they do convert to one that has T3 or T2, they can see a change in based on metabolic rate or energy or mood symptoms. So yeah, many do well with that. But if someone doesn't, that's sometimes an easy switch for them. Well, that's what I want to ask you. So we, I just jumped into it as if people know, but they may not know. So can you talk about T4, T3, T2, Reverse T3, and I've heard there's also T1, <laughs> and what the role these things have in the body and why you should care. For sure. Yeah, funny thing you mentioned reverse T3. I've spent the last week making it the most definitive thing I've ever written on that. It's about 15,000 words. It's about to come out pretty soon. So, yeah, so you mentioned the main thyroid hormones. And easy way to think about this, it's a story between iodine and tyrosine. So tyrosine is a common amino acid. We, we never really run out of it. We've got it in our muscles and lots of foods. We make that into a structural protein called thyroglobulin. And then thyroglobulin gets snapped some iodine atoms onto it. And that's what all these T numbers mean. It's thyroglobulin and then however many numbers of, of iodine atoms. So T4 is four of them. And the gland itself makes T4 and T3 and releases them both. And it makes about 90% T4, 10% T3 that it releases. Um, it also does release a little bit of reverse T3, and I'll come to that one. It's fascinating. And the body then takes those and pulls off more and more iodine as it uses them up. So after T3, it makes it into T2 and T1, T0. There's, there's no, no evidence that I've seen, at least, suggesting that T1 and T0 do anything. They're probably just part of the leftover process of getting rid of it and recycling it. But T2 does have effects upon controlling how the liver generates energy, how it burns fuel. But also T2 can affect ovarian function and fertility. And then T3 is one of the main ones that affects just the whole body basal metabolic rate. Many think that T4 is only a precursor to make T3 and T2, but now we know that it's important all by itself, that 
The brain responds in some unique ways to T4 that don't relate to T3, and also blood vessels and bones, T4 is important for them. Now, when your body makes T4 into T3, it makes T3 into two types. So this is kind of like a left hand and a right hand, and they're the same number of thumbs and fingers, right? But you couldn't put a left hand and a right hand glove. And so there's T3 and reverse T3. And reverse T3, it's the same iodine atoms with different configuration of them. And it's just simply it's an inactive form of T3. And the short version of T reverse T3 is that sometimes if people are sick, their body intentionally slows down its metabolism. You, know, you think about like if your car's sputtering, you're not going to you know, drive it really hard. And your body will do that too when you're ill. And one of the ways it does that is by siphoning more T4 into reverse T3 than it typically would. And that also happens if someone is taking too much thyroid hormone or if they're making a high amount and they're not treated for that. The body will siphon more T4 into, this, into the inactive form of T3 just to get rid of more of it. So yeah, that's the main overview of those thyroid hormones. So what happens if, um, let's say you're taking Synthroid, you know, you feel fine, but you do lab work and you discover you have very high reverse T3. It appears that the reverse T3 is the body's way of, again, of storing perhaps excess T4 for later use? Well, not for too long. You, you, you get rid of reverse T3 rather quickly. So in that scenario, there's two, two ways it could happen. So one of which is your TSH is below range and your dose of Synthroid is too high. And in those cases, that's why you would make too much. Now, the other problem about reverse T3 is that we don't really have good standards on what's high and what's low. And there's, there's a lot of times in which perfectly healthy people that have no problems whatsoever have high levels of reverse T3. So in the scenario you mentioned, if, if someone's lab levels were, were normal and were healthy and they did not have hyperthyroid blood levels and they were healthy and they had high reverse T3, it's of no relevance whatsoever. And that's, there's really good reason why it's not recommended to detect reverse T3 outside of the intensive care unit. Okay. So what, what happens with um, when people have a condition, you know, they have Hashimoto's, they have hypothyroidism. The thyroid was, was removed, you know, they, most of the time it sounds like they end up on Synthroid. Does that work for a lot of people? And if it doesn't work, what happens? And then what do they do? Well, by working and not working, I'd even go a little more granular. So Synthroid always compensates for the lack of thyroid hormone. And if someone were in that situation, they'd be much healthier taking it and they would not. But there's some percent of people which, you know, per survey might be 40% or 60% to where if you ask them if they're on if they're in that scenario and you ask them about you know the symptoms that led to this diagnosis or that were present before did they clear up and for many they did not and so there's there's many steps that one can take but often one of the easiest ones is just changing changing the pill you know taking a medicine that has like natural thyroid a fuller spectrum of those hormones and then the other easy step is to think about being on a dose of a pill like that that better approximates optimal thyroid levels. So the normal ranges are, are very accurate average ranges, but the problem is that they're biased to those who get thyroid tests. So the scenario you described is someone who's on long-term thyroid replacement, there's a whole lot more people who are on thyroid medicine that get tested than there are healthy people that get tested for thyroid levels. And even further, the more someone is symptomatic and struggling with their thyroid levels, they're going to get the most tests done. So the difficulty is when you average all those scores together, you see a range that's not the same as the range you see if you select people that have no thyroid problems and no thyroid symptoms and you screen them. So yeah, the other strategy is to say, yeah, let's take a type of thyroid medicine that gives a more full spectrum of hormones and let's target blood levels into a narrower range that would be reflective of healthy thyroid function, not just average thyroid function amongst those that may have problems with their thyroid. Well, what are some of the things that you found that, uh, you know, well, let me back it up. When people come to you with problems, do they tend to come to you with problems uh, because their synthroid, for instance, is uh, not alleviating the symptoms? Or is it that they have an undiagnosed uh, case of Hashimoto's or hypothyroidism or something else? I mean, who do you see and what, what kind of general paths do they take? Yeah, just to be super precise, I... My, I've got uh, six phenomenally good doctors that I meet with all the time, and they, they manage our patients. They do our patient care. So I, I, I'm not involved with that part of it any longer. But of those that do see us, 
that first scenario you described is extremely typical. Almost everyone is already on thyroid treatment and you know, they've been diagnosed and they're just not yet feeling their best. And so they're seeking out some of the way to go about addressing that. Uh, I can't, there, there's very few that come in with suspicious symptoms because most, most if they're at the level of just thinking, hey, something's wrong with my thyroid, they'll see whoever they're already seeing and just ask about that and explore that part. So yeah, most have already been diagnosed and on treatment for you know, any length of time, but just not yet where they want to be. So what, what, what have you discovered though? What are some, you know, what's unique about uh, your discoveries? What have you found? What tweaks, you know, for what conditions? You know, I know it's not in all cases, but what have you discovered that seems to help people? Well, the, the, two, the two steps that I mentioned were first and foremost, and they're not, you know, it's not all about the medicine, but it's that's something that someone's doing already, and they might as well take a pill that's going to work better for them. And then also the strategy, the second part of optimizing blood levels, not only does it help with symptom reversal for many, but there are those who are their thyroid is underperforming and they'd like to see, not only, not only do they want to feel better, but they'd like their thyroid to take over more. And so when blood levels are better, that improves the odds of the thyroid functioning better by itself. So then the other steps we look at are thinking about other things they may be taking. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of really common supplements that end up blocking thyroid function. Uh, most people, many are on really? multivitamin. Yeah. So pretty much all the multivitamins, with only a couple of exceptions I'm aware of, have iodine or folic acid or both. And either of those can block thyroid function for someone who's on thyroid treatment. Block it to what extent? Uh, it can be significant. It can slow it down by, you know, if they're on the amount of those things as commonly in a multi, perhaps 50 to 70% suppression of thyroid function. If they're taking higher amounts outside of a multi, it can be more dramatic. So yeah, one easy step is making sure that they're not doing things that are getting in the way of their efforts, not taking unnecessary supplements or pills or things that are counterproductive. Uh, and then there we look past at digestive health, you know, diet. So there's foods that are not compatible with their immune systems. We think about their body's circadian rhythms, you know, the, the daily cycles. The thyroid is a concentrator. So there's a lot of things we get exposed to on a daily basis that may not be at quantities that are relevant for the rest of us, but may build up in the thyroid and be significant. So we think about measuring the level of, of waste that can be found in the thyroid and then clearing those types of things out. But those are some of the main other steps that, that are taken. Well, I can tell you, uh, you seem to know far more than the, the thyroid doctors I've spoken to. They just <laughs> seem to throw a synthroid at you or tell you, uh, oh, you're fine. Your symptoms are, you know, you're crazy. Everything's okay. Your, your levels are within range. Or, uh, you know, yeah. anything but synthroids, no good. Or, you know, what's the role of iodine if you have no thyroid? Oh, we don't know. I mean, it's just so many, so many unanswered questions. You know, and iodine is a really big story. And it's a funny thing because it's it's important. Your thyroid needs it. But it's it's unlike all other nutrients. Um, every every nutrient you've heard of, you can think like zinc or calcium or um, B12, you name it you've got a certain amount floating in your bloodstream and your tissues are kind of like sponges that are just dropped in this, in this liquid. And how much is in the liquid is how much is in the sponge. And when there's enough, then there's enough. But your thyroid's not like that. It needs anywhere from 50 to 100 times as much as what's found in your blood of iodine. So it concentrates it. And if you've got a small, a tiny and consistent intake of iodine, that's fine. But if you ever get a lot of iodine, just imagine that if you couldn't stop things, you know, a lot pouring into your thyroid, just coursing in, you would release so much thyroid hormone that you could just damage your heart. So your body has, it's just like a fuse. Your body has a fuse that's blown, like when there's too much current in the house. And so when you're above some intake of iodine, you blow this fuse and your thyroid just completely shuts off. And what we've learned recently is it's not all or nothing. You know, it used to be thought that that was only relevant for high doses of iodine, but now we know that small doses above some threshold, they're not so much just shutting it off completely, but they're just like putting on the parking brake. So um, you know, I have a curiosity about some supplements. So if you have hypothyroidism or Hashimoto's or no thyroid at all, what is the role and the effectiveness of selenium and iodine? Two things that you know, I've heard that the thyroid uh, needs. It, it does need both. And the thought is how much does it need and how much do we typically get already? And then also, is there some of that found in thyroid medication? So selenium is important, and it's got a rather broad range of, of safety. You know, too little is bad for the body, but we're probably safe up to about, you know, 600 micrograms per day. And in most cases, we'll get between one or 200 micrograms in our diet. 
and supplementation rarely exceeds 200 micrograms. And supplementation is often a little hit or miss for how well it's absorbed. So in most cases, if someone's on reasonable supplementation and a good diet, they're probably okay on their selenium. If someone's selenium deficient, what happens then is they've got even a narrower acceptable amount of iodine. Then they, can, they can't handle even the tiniest excess or deficiency of iodine. Now, iodine, on the other hand, the range is probably about one to 300 micrograms for best amounts for maintenance. And most of us do get about 100 to 150 micrograms just in any diet. You know, good, bad, or sideways, we've got some iodine in that. Uh, multivitamins usually have 100, 75 to 150 micrograms, sometimes 200 in prenatals. But thyroid medications have substantial amounts of iodine. You know, Synthroid is uh, 65% iodine. Uh, T3 medicines are 56% iodine. And then natural thyroid is about 2% iodine. So when someone's on thyroid meds, they've got a lot of iodine right there as well. And that total amount, the further it gets above that 300 microgram threshold, the more apt it is just to suppress their thyroid function. Yeah, that, you know, that's like a big reveal is even the name T4, T3, et cetera, it hides the iodine component for most people's minds. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, like as you said that to me, that these medications have a lot of thyroid, I mean, sorry, have a lot of uh, iodine in them. I thought for a quick second, wait a minute, what? Oh, yes, that's right, because it's bound to the... The, the uh, fours and the threes, yeah. The thyroid molecule. <laughs> hmm. So what... Um, I want this call to help people. I really do. So, and and again, you know, I'm just one person, but I just, I feel and have experienced a little bit of the landscape of thyroid issues. And it's a very difficult thing. You know, uh, I do know anecdotally from speaking to friends and myself and all that, a lot of times you're told again, oh, you're fine or you're crazy or, oh, you're just lazy or whatever it is. And people have thyroid problems and it seriously affects their life. So right. what are some of the misconceptions that people have about thyroid issues. And, uh, you know, I want to clear that up for people because I want people to get help and at least think, huh, okay, there's another way. There's something that can be done if I have this problem. You know, a big one is that if a doctor tested you, that everything is fine. And it, it's, if your levels are normal, that's certainly better than if they're not. But both in terms of determining who, who has thyroid problems and also who's optimally treated, the normal range can miss quite a bit. And I mentioned before about just how, you know, healthy people that have no thyroid issues have a much tighter, narrower range than, than the normal range is considered. So the main thing we're talking about here is the TSH. There's different blood tests. And the TSH has the biggest difference between normal and optimal. Most labs today call normal between 0.4 and 4.5. Now, it's important to state that the TSH is backward. So the higher it is, the more your thyroid is underperforming and being yelled at to work harder. And then when it's overactive, the TSH goes low. Now, the low side of the scale is just exactly related between normal and optimal. When it's below 0.4, that's not good. That means there's too much thyroid hormone. But there's a big difference between the high side. So above 4.5, that's definitely a problem. But healthy people don't really have TSH scores higher than 2. So if someone's considering if that's a cause of their symptoms or if they're on thyroid treatment saying, hey, I'm not sure if I'm at the best treatment level and their TSH is between, it's normal, but it's between two and four and a half, that may be the reason why. Yeah, and most tests, it seems like they just look at TSH and, I mean, do they look, they don't seem to look at uh, T3 or reverse T3 or T2 or, you know, the, the thyroid tests. antibodies yeah, or anything, a, unless you do a full panel. Yeah, correct. So what would be in a full panel? What would you want to see if you were going to be, uh, you know, working with somebody? What should they request? You know, I, I, wish, I, wish T, I wish T2 was available. It's not commercially available as a lab test. Thyroid antibody panels, which include thyroglobulin and antithyroglobulin. There's also, I'm sorry, I didn't clarify. There's antithyroid peroxidase and antithyroglobulin. There's also thyroglobulin, which is not a thyroid antibody, but it's a marker of thyroid cell death. The other concern about thyroid function is that thyroid cancer is the most rapidly increasing cancer in North America by far. So if thyroid globulin gives clues about damage to the gland from swelling, nodules, goiter, or cancer. And, and then the active hormones, the free T3 and free T4, they can be helpful for sorting things out as well. So again, what, what are some of the misconceptions people have when they're seeking treatment, when they're having, you know, when they feel... Well, so you know, so like another, they, they another big problems. one... Another big one is the distinction between hypothyroidism and Hashimoto's. You mentioned those terms a few times. And so when someone's 
gland is underactive, we call that hypothyroidism. And the reasons for that are really Hashimoto's unless proven otherwise. If someone does have their thyroid removed, that's an obvious cause. The most common cause for removal is suspicion of cancer. And in most cases, that's an, a, a byproduct of chronic inflammation from Hashimoto's. The other common reason that's not Hashimoto's for low thyroid would be the reaction from medications, the two big ones being amiodarone or lithium. And in many cases, they harm the thyroid because they trigger Hashimoto's. So when someone has thyroid antibodies measured and they come back positive, that confirms there is an autoimmune attack, which we would call Hashimoto's. However, half of people with Hashimoto's never have measurable antibodies. So the absence of thyroid antibodies does not rule out Hashimoto's. So yeah, unless there's some obvious reason for hypothyroidism that's known, we assume that it's Hashimoto's and that's proven otherwise. Hmm. So what, uh, how often does uh, you know thyroid hormone supplementation work for people with Hashimoto's or with uh, hypothyroidism and, you know, what kind of problems do people run into and what kind of tweaks might they need in certain circumstances? Yeah. Yeah. How often does it work and how often can it work? You know, it, as it does it work, that was that 40 to 60% number I threw up before, but I would really argue that it, it can work. I'm sorry. I shouldn't just say that thyroid hormone supplementation, but when that's part of overall care, people should have the expectation that they can regain the level of health they had before the diagnosis happened, before it all came about. And that can involve uh, a more comprehensive type of thyroid medication, being more strategic about the blood levels, about dialing in those micronutrients. Also, the circadian rhythm, the cortisol rhythm is an important thing. So cortisol is a hormone that we make a lot of in the morning and we shut it off at night. Some people make a lot all the time. Some make a lot at night and too little in the morning and others make a little all the time. And those are all factors that can make the body not respond properly to thyroid hormones, even when the right amount is there. So yeah, one of the consideration is regaining a healthy daily cortisol cycle. So, okay, hmm, interesting. So how would, uh, let's say someone's taking Synthroid and they take it at a time when their cortisol is high versus when their cortisol is low, would that affect its, its action? Well, it the time of day you take thyroid medicine can affect the cortisol. And that's one of the reasons why it's recommended to take thyroid hormones either uh, first thing in the morning is the most common recommendation. The very last thing right before bed is also a reasonable second choice. But there's other versions of thyroid medicine that some doctors advocate taking at midday or later in the day. And the drawback is just that it can alter and, and hurt the cortisol rhythm all by itself. So yeah, morning or bedtime is best for, for thyroid medicines. Well, right there, that would be high and low cortisol. You know, morning would be high for, for I mean, for a certain percentage of people. And then night would be no, low, you're, so or you're, if you're so unusual, you're right. it can be the reverse. So what happens there is that the, the effect that thyroid hormones have are rather delayed. They're absorbed pretty slowly. So when they're taken at bedtime, if we could do it perfectly, we would have thyroid hormones hit the bloodstream at around you know, three or four in the morning. That's the closest approximation to how the body does that. And when they're taken at night, they're absorbed slowly enough to where there's still a decent amount then. And taken in the morning, there's some part that's absorbed a little earlier along. And that's often an easier time of day also to take it away from food. So by taking it then, that ends up being the, the best tie-in for cortisol. Cortisol will elevate anywhere between the first the first hour or so to the first six to eight hours after a spike in thyroid hormone levels. So taking it at nighttime or first thing replicates that, but taking it later in the day could, could push cortisol to elevate too much later in the day. Mm, okay. And you mentioned circadian rhythms. So, you know, how are, I mean, you know, if your chronotype is lark versus night owl <laughs> or like really late night owl, how does that appear to uh, interact with you know, people that have thyroid issues? Yeah, that's a great question. So we've got, we've got a basal circadian cycle, and then there's a lot of variations on people's times where they're most alert or whatnot. So regardless of one's chronotype, there's still, there's still a healthy cortisol response in which cortisol is highest before they wake up and lowest when they're going to sleep. For some people, that might be slightly different times of day. It might be a little later than others for, or earlier than others for those who are that more that large chronotype or a little later for those who are an owl chronotype, but they still have that same underlying structure to it. So if someone's waking up and that's when their cortisol is low, 
that's that's a phenomenon that correlates with a lot of health problems, including just a block of thyroid hormone. There's quite a bit of data saying that that may be one of the strongest predictors of earlier death. You know, one, the Whitehall 2 study looked at that, and they looked at it as a way to gauge overall stress response. And what they concluded was that the they, they watched a large number of British civil servants over about a six-year period, and just they took a lot of health measurements along the way. And, you know, it was such a big number of people that there were some that died during the course of observation. And then they went back and said, okay, of those who died, which of these things we were measuring best predicted that? And the second strongest predictor was smoking status, which is bad for your health, not a surprise. But the strongest predictor was the circadian rhythm. And they thought about that as a function of the body's chronic stress response, the body's stress resilience. Huh. Hey. Well, the more I ask you, the more questions there are. But um, <laughs> yeah. it just shows me, like I said, the, the I don't know what planet you live in, but you live in a more advanced planet than the, than the one I've been running around on. Because like I said, I, I don't hear any of these things from, uh, from talking to, to endocrinologists. <laughs> <laughs> What are, what are some good questions people can ask to get better help than they may be getting right now? Good questions to ask their, their current physicians? or Right, yeah, their current physician, you know, what should they ask them to help themselves and to evaluate if their physician really is, is hip to what needs to be done or if they're just following the, you know, the lowest common denominator standard of care, you know, that seems to help very few. You know, that's a really good question and not one that I've thought of much before. Something that does come to mind is, just to think about what, what would that doctor see as their goals for this person's health and their expectations. And if the goals are, you know, not to be sick and leave it at that, you know, that's, that may be something to where the doctor could do a good job at that. But if your goals are loftier, if your goals are to really feel like you did before you had a certain diagnosis or really manage a symptom or just maximize your health span and not succumb to chronic disease and, and, and if your goals were to manage that through lifestyle, you know, those are good things you'd want to be aware of. And if you were, I, I guess that's more of a matter of just eliciting a response to know what the doctor's biases are, as opposed to bringing out some type of an approach the doctor would not do otherwise. But if the doctor's goals or expectations did not meet yours, then I think you just want to be aware of that as soon as possible and you know, find someone where you did have a better alignment in those ways. Yeah, the question in every profession, it seems to me in my life, is how do you find someone that's really good if you feel like you have a problem that just is an outlier or is very difficult to solve? So that's why I want to ask you in the world of, you know, endocrinologists, how do you know that someone's good or not? Are there any questions you could ask to uh, evaluate that person? Well, and it may not even be per se to evaluate them, but it's like how good of a fit they are to your goals. They might do a great job for someone that is in a different situation that has a more, perhaps a severe, urgent need that needs to get back to a stable level. But but yeah, being clear on where you want to go to and what you'd like to do. And, and also, there's always a certain amount of time frame, you know, so if it wouldn't be fair to say, you know, I've been at this, this protocol now for one month, and I'm no better, this is, you know, what's up, you know, give, give, give a sense about what is a reasonable time frame for you to see how much recovery and which symptoms should recover and to what extent and then keep tabs on that. And if the time frame is played out and maybe you've made some headway, it might be time to pivot with them and maybe they got to rethink another direction. But if you made no headway or regressed and that time frame has come and gone, then see if they have other things to consider. And if not, maybe a matter of seeing someone else who would be more aligned with what your goals are. Oh, that's good. And time frame is important. So in the world of uh, you know thyroid issues and, and fixing them or getting improvement in results, it's not a fast thing is what you're saying. It needs, I don't know, a month, several months really to see what's happening or, you know, I know it's varies for everybody, but is this more of a long-term so there's, several month thing? Well, there's two cycles to that. The first part is having, you know, getting back to optimal thyroid levels. And then the second part is once that happens, there's a certain lag time for the body to really respond to those levels and function well again. And there's two categories of symptoms. There's those that are more chemical in nature, like your, energy levels or your alertness. And there's those that are more structural in nature, like the health of your tendons and ligaments, or for those that have had hair loss from thyroid disease, the hair coming back again. And the general rule of thumb is that the more chemical type symptoms, they may respond quite quickly to being back at optimal thyroid status. They may really clear up in the first few weeks of that. But some of the structural symptoms, there's a lag time of 
old unhealthy cells that grew during the time of bad thyroid levels, those to go away, well, new healthy cells that are now growing under the conditions of better thyroid levels, the new ones to come in. And for some parts of the body, that could be a year or so for hair health, for example, or if someone had bone problems, that could be a few years. So yeah, just knowing what symptoms are related to that and then how long after optimal thyroid levels they should take to respond. All right. Well, very good. So uh, what are some resources for listeners where they can start this journey and find out more and take charge of their own health? What should they do? Um, you know, easy thing as far as content that, that I've put out, uh, drchristensen.com is my main hub for that. And pretty much any question you could think about relative to thyroid disease, if you just Google Alan Christensen and, you know, how much iodine do I need or Alan Christensen and what are my best thyroid levels? You know, I've, I've probably written a three to 5,000 word post on all those things and done videos and summaries for that. And, and that's all just free stuff that anyone can access online. Okay, very good. Well, Alan, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks again for having me. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.